Good afternoon and welcome to the program to everybody out there. Uh, as Jamie said, I'm Don Meyer, Chief Marketing Officer at the New Jersey Society of CPAs. Uh, today's topic is a critical one for the CPA profession, the shrinking pipeline of people pursuing accounting degrees and taking the CPA exam. And uh, very shortly, I'll show you some statistics that kind of bolster uh, that, uh, that trend. Uh, joining me today to discuss the current environment and solutions for bolstering the pipeline are first, Adrian Gonzalez, who is managing editor of Going Concern. Uh, this next part was not a part of her original bio that I was gonna read, but it's on the website and I just felt like I, I had to read it. Um, Adrian is a skilled cat wrangler who lives in Richmond, Virginia, where she can be found hiking along the James River and yelling at clouds. Welcome, Adrian. Hi. All right, our next speaker is uh, Joe Hunt, who is a CPA and a senior in the accounting and auditing group at Sobel Co. Uh, I found out about a month ago that uh, Joe is a fellow New York Jets fan. Uh, so he's a great person to talk about any challenges uh, because he knows all about pain and suffering. So welcome, Joe. Thanks for having me, Don, I appreciate it. All right. And last, but certainly not least, is Jerry McGinnis who is a retired office managing partner for KPMG in Philadelphia and currently is an executive in residence at Rowan University. He's the, also the author of a new book entitled Advice for a Successful Career in the Accounting Profession, How to Make Your Assets Greatly Exceed Your Liabilities. Welcome, Jerry. Hey, Don, great to be with you this morning. Thanks for having us. Great, thanks all three of you. Uh, before we get into the Q&A session, I'd like to provide some uh, background information on trends in college accounting enrollments and CPA exam registrations. And hopefully I will not screw this up. All right, here we go. Um, so first let's start with the, the most recent AICPA trends report. The AICPA does this every couple of years to give the uh, rest of the profession idea of, of what it's looking like at the college level and also at the, at the graduate level. So the first few slides I'm gonna show you um, are gonna paint a, kind of a bleak picture, but I just want you to keep in mind as you look at these slides, uh, there is some context that I'm gonna provide at the end. So first, uh, the first thing that the combined number of bachelor's and master's degree graduates in accounting has dropped steadily since reaching a high in 2015, 2016. Obviously that sounds bad, that's a bad trend, but in a couple of slides, I'll provide a little bit of context that maybe will make that sound not quite as bad as it does just by looking at that one bullet. Uh, the next thing is a number of candidates who passed their fourth section of the CPA exam fell 11% between 2019 and 2020 and dropped another 5.5% between 2020 and 2021. Again. Bad trend, but uh, there's some things happening that, that maybe will make people feel a little bit better about the situation. And of course, anytime you look at any statistic that's based in 2020 and 2021, you also have to consider all right, how much did the pandemic impact that, that percentage. The numbers were, were already going down before the pandemic. It was accelerated by the pandemic, but hopefully there's some things coming out of the pandemic that, that can be done to, to help out with those numbers. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the Illinois CPA Society has also done some extensive research into uh, why individuals decide not to sit for the exam. And, and among these six bullets, I want you to pay attention to, to a few things. One is the word value or valuable. Let's use three different times in this slide. There was a lot of feedback from individuals who have decided not to sit for the CPA exam. That is in this research from Illinois, indicating that they weren't seeing the value in the effort required to achieve their, their CPA license. Now, I, I do wanna make a distinction because this will come up a little bit later between the effort required to get the license and the value that somebody would get out of that effort versus the value that somebody sees in the actual license. Because there is a bit of a disconnect that the, uh, the panel is gonna talk about. So I want you to pay attention to that word value. And the other thing is that fifth bullet. Um, individuals who have decided not to sit for the exam say they, they don't see their employers or prospective employers supporting or requiring a CPA license. And that to me is a, is a big issue. I think if you asked any accounting firm out there, they would absolutely say that they encourage uh, graduates to sit for the exam because they understand the value of that CPA license. But for some reason, uh, graduates aren't seeing it. Now, some of it might have to do with the fact that more and more graduates are going directly into industry. They might be the only accounting or finance person at that company, so there's no culture for the CPA license. That, that might be part of it. But I think some of it also is is psychological, and, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that too, is that, is that we try and 
uh, dig ourselves out of this hole or the profession tries to dig itself out of this hole and bring more people into the profession, we, we almost have to be amateur psychologists because one of the things that came up during the Illinois research, a, a big factor for why individuals decided not to sit for the exam. There, if you ask 10 people, 10 CPAs, why individuals aren't sitting, you're gonna get 10 different responses. But in this research, a big reason behind it was fear of failure that these, these young people were just, they didn't want to put the effort in because they were afraid at the end of the day that they were going to fail. Um, so I think that's, that's a big uh, area of concern for the profession and a big area for opportunity for employers and prospective employers to, um, to show or to demonstrate to these graduates that sitting for the CPA exam is important, that getting your license is important, and that they will get supported in their journey along the way, because not everybody's journey is the same. Some people pass right out of the gate. We did a podcast recently w with people who got the uh, Elijah Watt Sells Award, so they, they achieved uh, very highly with this CPA license. Other people, it takes them several years to pass, but they need that support from the employer in order to get over that fear of failure, because a lot of times, even though they see the value in the license, and they might have ambitions to get the license, and that sounds really good, we're human beings, and for human beings, fear is pain. And they want to avoid that pain, and pain is, is not taking the exam. That can override the ambition they have about, about achieving that uh, CPA license. Uh, so here's another thing that you may not be aware of. I learned about this a couple of weeks ago. This one was a, a bit of a, um, a gut punch. So uh, this is a chart that shows um, birth rates uh, going back to 1980. And you can see from 1980 until about 2007, there were some fairly predictable um, changes in the birth rate. And basically the way it was described to us by um, an educator from uh, Bradley University in Illinois, he said that essentially when there's a recession in the United States, uh, birth rates go down. And then as a country comes out of the recession, the birth rates go back up because, you know, again, people are, are human. Uh, psychology plays a role in this. If, if they're worried about their job, their future, finance, and so forth, they're less likely to bring a, a new person into the world. But as they feel more comfortable with their finances and the economy, the birth rates go up um, until 2008. So 2007, you can see where that line is. Uh, birth rates had started to tick back up, but then we had the Great Recession in 2008 and 2009. So the anticipation was that after the Great Recession, after we started to recover, so a few years later, we had started to recover that the birth rate would tick back up but as you can see from this chart not only did it not go back up it continued to go down there was a thought in 2020 that the pandemic would cause another uptick in birth rates because people were stuck at home um, and they thought there would be another baby boom because you know people nothing else to do they would start producing babies that didn't happen either and but that makes a lot of sense because just like during a recession if people are worried about uh, their future and their finances, and they're worried about that during the pandemic, it makes sense that they wouldn't want to bring um, another life into the world. So 2008 was basically the beginning of the Great Recession. Uh, 2008 plus 18, which would be the number of years that somebody, you know, from, from birth until you graduate high school, 18 years, 2008 plus 18 brings us to 2026. So this is why I bring up, whoops, let me get this wrong, there we go. This is why I bring it up. The prediction is that in 2026, there will be a 20% drop in college enrollments. They're calling it the enrollment cliff. Again, this is not something that I had heard of until a couple of weeks ago, but was brought up in an event for state CPA societies to talk about this, this pipeline issue. So um, 2026, a roughly 20% drop in enrollments across the country. I can get a little bit more specific here in New Jersey. Here's a breakdown across the country. Um, in our part of the country, that includes New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, they're looking at about 18 percent. Um, if you're wondering why, say, the West or, say, Texas and that surrounding states, why they're gonna, uh, predicting increases, uh, you have to look at demographics and, and migration patterns. People are migrating to warmer places. They're going out West. They're going South. They want, they want warmer weather. So the, the feeling is that the states where people are moving to will see less of an impact from this enrollment cliff because uh, more people are moving there. Whereas in the Northeast and the Midwest, where people are leaving for weather reasons or other reasons, um, that, that um, enrollment cliff will hit them particularly hard. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's kind of the, 
the environment that we're looking at. I mentioned the, the, the trends in accounting enrollments or accounting graduates and those sitting for the CPA exam. And now we have this enrollment cliff of 20, expected 20% 20 decline in college enrollments. So this, I know this all sounds really, really bad, but context always helps and context matters. So if you look at accounting degree graduates going back 10 years or 15 years, accounting degree graduates are still near historic levels. Yes, they are down and they are trending down. But you're still, if you look at 1920 versus 0506, um, you're looking at a basically 17,000 increase of accounting graduates between in that time frame. And if you go back to the, the mid 90s, it's even more significant. So the trend being downward obviously is bad, but we, we need to keep things in perspective a little bit. The numbers are still are still near historic levels. Uh, the other the other two bullets, the next two bullets are all related to diversity in the profession. Um, the ASCPA trends report showed that there has been a rise of almost five percentage points okay. in the portion of new accounting grads hired at CPA firms who are ethically diverse. And ethically diverse candidates and women have made significant gains at leadership level, levels. And why does that matter? Well, all the research about why diverse candidates aren't choosing to go into accounting and finance, one of the big reasons is they don't see themselves in the profession. They don't see themselves at companies and accounting firms and so forth. So any inroads that can be made to bring in more diverse individuals into the profession is good for the, the pipeline long term. And the other thing I wanted to mention is CPA evolution. So that is basically the, the next version of the CPA exam, which is expected to launch in the next few years. So two points on that. One is anytime that there's a new version of the, of the CPA exam that's released, uh, um, more people rush to take the exam because the thinking is, well, I've been, I've been in school, I've been taking a CPA exam review course, and um, I wanna take the exam that I've been preparing for. So there's a rush to always take the exam that, that you know as opposed to waiting for one that you're not familiar with that might contain things that you're not familiar with. So there, we'll probably see an uptick in the next couple of years when there's people rushing to take the current version of the exam. The other good thing about CP Evolution is the effort is being made to bring um, a different group of people into the profession, not just more diverse population, but reaching out to folks who are involved in IT or data analytics. Um, the the uh, exam will be more comprehensive. It will cover more areas. Those folks that are being hired at accounting firms and accounting and finance departments of, of large corporations who wouldn't traditionally take the CPA exam, it's hoped that CPA evolution will bring those people in, into the and then the last slide I, I wanted to talk about before we bring the panel in is again, some more uh, data from the Illinois Society. I mentioned that one of the reasons, or some of the reasons that the uh, that candidates don't sit for the exam is because they're not seeing the value vis-a-vis -vis the effort that they have to put in. But of those individuals who are unsure about becoming CPAs, 86% of them still view the credential as valuable or very valuable. So they still see the value in the license, just they're just not sure they want to put in that effort in order to, to get to it. And if they get it, um, are, is it going to be worth that effort or are they going to be able to achieve anything more than they would have if they hadn't pursued the license? And, and the CPA credential is even acknowledged as being valuable or very valuable among those who do not plan on becoming CPAs. So the license still has a lot of value, but we have to get into that detail of, of the disconnect between the value they see in the license and the effort that is required to get it and whether or not they see that as being, being worthwhile. All right, so now I wanna bring the experts in. Um, but I did wanna mention just before we, I guess that first question, you know, what are we hoping to accomplish today? Um, we're certainly not gonna solve the pipeline problem in the next uh, 45 minutes or an hour or so. But what we wanna try and do is identify the problem. Um, everyone talks about, okay, we have a pipeline problem, but if you ask them what the problem is, again, you'll get very different answers. Some will say it's awareness at the high school level or even middle school level. Others will say it's issues with the, the license itself or the examination or the requirements to get the examination. We'll get into that a little bit. So we want to identify the problem. Let's talk about the problem. Then let's identify and discuss possible causes. Again, if you ask 10 people, why is this happening? You're probably going to get 10 different responses. So we want to talk a little bit about that. And then we want to try and identify and discuss maybe some possible solutions. We're not going to solve the problem, but hope, you know, we have 400 plus people, maybe 500 uh, people who are, are watching this webinar. 
and we, we want you to have some takeaways, to be able to say, okay, I understand what the problem is. Um, now, maybe on a personal level, I can I can help somebody along in the process. I can talk to my firm or my company, and on an individual level, you can, you can help um, try and fix this problem or at least make it a little bit better. So, all right, so we got all the statistics out of the way. We got some of the background out of the way. Now let's, let's, let's hear from our panelists. Um, Jerry, let's start with you. I know that you have visited a lot of college campuses in the last year or so. We talked about that when we did a podcast uh, a number of months ago. What are you seeing and hearing from those schools in terms of college accounting program enrollments? Yeah, happy to comment on that, Don. But maybe before I do, I just want to react quickly to a couple things in the slides. Some some great information Absolutely. you shared there. Yeah. Um, one thing is your slides, I think, were largely focused on the front end of the pipeline, right? But another dimension of this issue and this challenge is what's happening at the back end. And we all know that the baby boomers are retiring. And if you think about the baby boomers, I think the common definition of that demographic is people born between 1946 and 1964. So if you do the math on that, the people that were at the front end of that baby boom wave are now in their late 70s. And the people that are the youngest baby boomers, those born in 1964, are actually in their late 50s, 58 or so. So as I think about that in the context of the profession, I mean, people retire at all different ages and a lot of people work into their 60s and 70s. But um, the big accounting firms, the big four and the other national firms tend to have a mandatory retirement age that is around 60 years old. So you have quite a few people right in the middle of that baby boom wave exiting the profession. And even the people um, who were born later in that baby boom wave are going to be exiting the profession. So you've got huge people coming out the back end. And that, with the, with the shortage of people entering the profession, I think really makes the situation a lot more challenging. Um, as, as I'm sure members of your audience are aware, the AICPA has estimated that a very significant percentage of their membership is going to be eligible for retirement in the near term. So um, it's kind of ironic, right? Because as I think about the profession today and the total number of accountants employed by the big four and in public accounting, it's probably at record numbers. Um, I don't have hard data on that, but I kind of base that statement on every year the firms report record revenues. Revenues have been increasing pretty significantly um, and that's not just the big four, that's firms of all sizes. And, you know, while technology is starting to impact this, there tends to be a pretty strong correlation between revenue and, and headcount, right? So as revenues rise, I'm pretty confident headcount is rising as well. Um, but to break the pipeline line challenge down a little bit further and maybe level set for the audience, there was one of your slides, I think it was from the Illinois Society, talked about one of the reasons people may not be pursuing the credential is that their employer doesn't require it. And if you think about that in the context of the broader public accounting landscape, um, we all know that advisory has been growing significantly across all sizes of firms. Well, if you're an advisory, I mean, different firms define the services different ways, but most people in advisory don't really need a CPA. Uh, if you're in tax, I think a CPA is nice to have, but it's probably not required. So it's really the audit side that having the CPA is essential. Obviously, it's required to sign an audit report. But if you sort of break that down further, entry-level people, people in their first three, four, five years, um, are not really required to have a CPA. They're certainly encouraged by their firms. And many firms have a policy that you're not going to get promoted to manager if you don't have a CPA license. But let's be honest, by the time you get the manager five, six years in, a lot of those people have already left the firm. So there's a, a significant percentage, even within the audit practice, that probably don't feel like they're required to have it. So, you know, you unbundle all that. And I would say from a public accounting perspective, it's a pretty small slice, maybe 10 to 15% of the total employment that actually requires the CPA to do their job. Um, now, that is not in any way intended to minimize 
the issue or the challenge. It's a real challenge. Um, you know, the capital markets depend on auditors, our broader economy depends on auditors. So a shortage of CPAs, a shortage potentially of auditors is a serious issue and concern. Um, now to answer your question, sorry for that preamble, but I thought no, it was important okay. that was good. Like yeah. the back end challenge as well. Um, yes, in connection with my book, I probably visited or talked to 25 university accounting program chairs and or business school deans in the last couple months, not just here in New Jersey or the tri-state area, but really all across the U.S., including some of the biggest and most prestigious accounting programs. And with maybe one exception, everybody told me the same thing. They told me their enrollments are down and down not just minimally, like two, three, five percent, but down 10, 12, 15, 18 percent. So to put that in accounting parlance, it's a material drop off and it's rather alarming. I mean, I was certainly aware that there were less people sitting for and passing the exam. And that was concerning. But the drop in enrollment is very concerning. And when combined with some of your birth rate statistics, I think it really highlights how big a challenge the profession has. Right, absolutely. Um, and I, I think one of the things that I had learned was the, um, you know, there were certainly uh, enrollment drops during the pandemic. And unfortunately, a lot of those enrollment drops happened amongst um, underrepresented minorities, uh, that folks who, who um, hopefully would have gone to school or maybe gone to community college, a disproportionate number of the people who either left school or decided not to go to school uh, were from underrepresented minorities. And that, and that is a big problem, not just for the colleges, but also for this profession that's trying to make itself, trying to make itself more diverse. Um, yeah, Adrian. just to react quickly to yeah, that, sure. Don, I, I think that's a big part of the solution. The profession needs to do a better job you know, reaching those underrepresented populations. And we'll talk more about this later, maybe, but from a recruiting strategy standpoint, there's some things I think that can be done there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so Adrian, research from the Illinois CPA Society had indicated that, that students and young professionals are not pursuing the CPA credential because they feel they can be successful in their anticipated or chosen careers without it. Um, you've written a lot for going concern about the pipeline. Um, what are you hearing about young professionals' attitudes towards the CPA license? Well, first of all, what, what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing is that people are leaving, people are just bypassing public accounting, as you said in the beginning, or they're going in, they're not doing their two years, they're leaving at six months, maybe a year. So they're not even meeting the experience requirement because they're out of there, they're gone, and they've got an industry offer and they don't need their CPA. So, you know, I started in CPA review many, many years ago. And so when we talk about um, the value proposition of the CPA, you know, I had people calling me in tears going through the exam. It's gotten exponentially more difficult over the years. There's a greater wealth of information that's being added all the time. You know, we'll see, you said about the CPA evolution, you know, they're testing more stuff. I talked to a professor last week who was saying, this is too much. There's too much in this exam. So it's already overwhelming to people. And now it's like, and I understand the practicality of it. You know, those things need to be tested because it's about, you know, entry level knowledge, but it's just more and more and more is being piled on and people don't want to do it and they don't have to do it. As, as you said, and as Jerry said, you know, it's not a matter of you're not going to get a promotion if you don't get this CPA they're gone before they get to the point where they become manager. So, I mean, the sentiment that I'm hearing is not much different from what I've heard in 2007 when I was working directly with CPA candidates. Just, it's a lot, it's a lot. And the, the thing that has changed is that uh, the path has really changed. So people don't feel like they're kind of being, you know, funneled through the get out of college, go to big four, you know, get the CPA, go out. They're kind of just diverging wherever they want at this point. Right. Now, that, that actually something you just said uh, kind of brings me to a question that we received, because um, the idea of time comes up a lot. Um, the time required on a daily basis to study for the exam. But one issue that's come up a lot recently is the time you're allotted to pass the exam. So once you know, you have that 18 month window. Once you pass one part, you got 18 months to pass them all. Um, there's certainly and we're going to get into it, the 150 hour requirement. We're going to talk about that. But um, I'm wondering now if that whole idea, if there's going to be more in the exam, if that whole idea of 
the amount of time you have from the beginning to the end to pass the exam, whether that's something that the profession should look at. Um, because it, it is, I think, again, if you have a fear of failure and you um, are looking at it saying, well, I only have 18 months to pass the exam and I'm working, um, is, you know, is that something the, the, that the profession should be looking at is that whole idea of the 18 month window? Well, we should go Maybe. back to testing twice a year and make everybody sit for all four parts at once. I'm kidding. But uh, no, I think part of the thing that, that we hear is that, um, you know, there used to be sort of a defined busy season that you could plan around, right? And as we're, right. and this is kind of, you know, we're dealing with these staffing shortages, busy season is stretching longer and longer. Suddenly, you know, it's less of a season and it's more of a reality. Um, so that's definitely a concern for sure. That's affecting, I think, you know, people's, not only their willingness, but are they able you know, but people can't create time out of nothing. If you've got like, you know, months and months and months of busy season, where are you supposed to find the time to do this? Right, exactly. Adrian, yeah, I think that that's a big consideration. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Was that yeah, Adrian, to your point, when I was studying for the exam, I was I started taking it in 2018 and finished um, buzzer beater of a lifetime, like two days before the entire state shut down. But that 18 month timeline to me, was even uh, exacerbated because they were changing the exam. So I'm a little worried about when they're changing the exam now. Basically what they had me do was, I had to schedule it out this way. I studied for an exam for three months, took it on the first day of the testing window. Now there's no more testing windows, thankfully. But then I got that score at the end of the testing window. So then during the testing window, I studied for the next part. So I could take one in the beginning of the window, one at the end. Um, I'm a little concerned that when this new when this new test comes out, how quickly are people going to get scores? Because for anybody taking the exam right now, they're able to take as many, you know, if you fail apart today, you can take it as many times in that testing window, which is a welcome change to the exam um, that I didn't that I didn't have. Um, so we'll just kind of see how that goes when they, you know, revamp the exam in 24. Continuous testing has been a huge yeah, improvement. Definitely. Sorry, I was going to say, Don, I'll just quickly add, I think it's an easy fix to extend that to 24 months. And, you know, there would be no diminution in standards, right? If, if somebody can get through all four parts in 24 months, that's a reasonable time frame in my mind. So that that's probably low hanging fruit and an easy fix because that is a huge issue for a lot of candidates. Yeah. I, and I believe, I'm not mistaken, I believe that was discussed when they were talking about the CPA evolution. Um, and now we, we hear a lot of chat, I mean, a lot of chatter about the 150 hour requirement, which I'm going to ask you about in a little bit. Um, but I, I think the next, um, the next big thing might be that, uh, 18 month window because uh, everything we did our own survey, Illinois did surveys, every, you know, AICPA does surveys and time keeps coming up as a, as a bigger and bigger factor. And, um, you know, if, if I understand that you want the best of the best to pass the exam, but you also want to uh, accommodate kind of this new reality, as Adrian was saying, of like a 12 month long busy season and, and the other responsibilities that people have. And, you know, I, I agree with you, Jerry, I'm not sure adding an extra six months to an 18 month window is really going to make um, that much of a difference. Um, but Joe, let me, let me bounce over to you, get you involved. Um, there are some CPAs listening to this webcast that are thinking that that young professionals uh, perceptions of the CPA license speaks more to their, let's call it generational values than the license's relevance and, and prestige. In other words, millennials and Gen Z don't want to put the effort in to pass the exam. Um, so you're the youngest person on this webcast. Uh, what are your feelings on that, on that perception of a CPA license generation gap? Thanks for the question, Don. I, I would say that it's true in some respects, but not all. My CPA exam journey was, um, you know, you kind of described it in your in some of your comments before. Uh, some people pass it right away, and some people take take the longer route. I certainly took that longer route, and I think I actually happy I took the longer route to be to be totally honest. But I think why I took that longer route um, was, you know, I, I just wasn't you know, the test taking wasn't wasn't for me. But I, I understood why I was doing this. I understood from the get go. Like I walked into the college information session saying to my parents, kind of like, I, I just want to make sure when I leave here, I was committed to staying for the five years because I knew I had the 150 credits. I said, what what school can I go to that's going to help is going to help best prepare me to get my MBA and then also um, put CPA after my name. Um, I, I remember getting somebody's business card and saying, like, this is what I like need to get to. This is this is it. So 
I think I, you know, attribute to uh, attribute a lot of that to the first high school professor that I um, high school teacher that I had. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do in high school, but she just told me right out of the gate, you know, you can go work for the FBI, you can go work for the New York Yankees, you can go work for the Jets. Um, you can do it willingly. You can go work for the Jets. And, you know, you, the, the accounting profession and being a CPA can take you wherever you want to go. So I really attribute to, to recognizing that value right out of the gate from the people that informed me and, and told me and taught me about accounting from the get-go. Uh, I see, you know, the not wanting to put the effort in uh, in addition to the fear of failure is, you know, that's, that's the one thing that we, we need to overcome. That fear of failure is something that everybody's going to attribute, you know, you'll go through in life. I took the exam 14 times. Like I went into the Prometric Testing Center in Farallon, New Jersey, 14 times. And I remember having com conversations with people and they're just, you know, you got to get up off the mat. You know, once you, once you don't pass something, you know, that's life. Like not everything's going to go your way and not everything's going to be, you're not going to be super successful. There are plenty of 74s and 72s, but that fear of fear of failure is something, you know, I know everybody that's graduating college has the ability to overcome. Um, and I, one thing that was, was really cool was I got the support from Soul and company. You know, I had people that I was working with telling me, you know, don't worry about signing off you know, at whatever time you need to today to make sure you get that long, you know, that time after work as much as you need to study. So that support was there. And it's really because, you know, they all recognized um, the value that it was going to bring in public. And I understand that some people are just going to public for a year, year and a half, two years now. But, um, you know, I think it'll be, I think the way the world's going and the way we're, the way we're moving, um, the people that I'm working with right now that are, that are just graduating are a little bit older than me. We do see the relevance of it. We do see the, um, the effort that's needed to, you know, to pass it and, and why it's important. All right. It's, you know, as, as I was researching, um, for this, this uh, webcast, I found a, uh, a study from the AICPA, I think it was five or six years ago. And in it, there was a, a paragraph that encouraged, uh, educators, to act as kind of amateur psychologists and encouraging their students to essentially say so, because professors, you know, traditionally say that they don't teach to the exam, which which makes sense. But the AACPA was encouraging them to say, as they were teaching them different concepts, hey, um, if this may be on the exam or, you know, don't worry, you've got this. Essentially just very encouraging to say, listen, all right, I'm not teaching to the exam and it's not a CPA re exam review course, but what you're learning in this classroom will help you for the exam. Don't worry, you've got this. So there was, it was amazing to me how much psychology played into this. I always kind of thought about it as a, as a fairly um, simple transaction. You know, you take the exam, you pass it or you don't, but I didn't realize how much psychology played into it until I started reading all of this, all this research. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned um, high school joke, because that, that's something I kind of want to dig into a little bit, because I've, I've said a couple of times that if you ask somebody, what's the problem <clears throat> or why is there a pipeline challenge, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you'll get a lot of different answers. And I'm wondering whether, you know, we, we saw the, the graduation numbers. They are down, but still near historic highs. Um, and of course, the CPA license numbers are down as well. So I'm just wondering whether it's a an awareness issue, because uh, a lot of people believe that we should be in high schools and even middle schools talking about the accounting profession. That would be to raise awareness, because at that point, there's still many, many years removed from, from sitting for the CPA exam. Is it an awareness issue, or is it more fundamental related to the license and the process and, and that 18-month window and 150 hours and things like that? So, I mean, Adrian, I'll just throw that question out to you. Do you think it's... Um, an awareness issue about accounting and the value of an accounting career, or do you think it's more fundamental and it's, it's maybe about kind of the CPA license and things that might need to be tweaked with the, with the process of getting your license? I mean, I think Joe just perfectly demonstrated, you know, he had a teacher that, you know, kind of pushed him in that direction. And I think the awareness is there. But one thing that accounting is missing that other professions along the same lines don't have. Uh, you look at like first generation college students, right? Children of immigrants who are the first ones to go to college. Their mother isn't saying you need to become an accountant. She's saying you need to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. So I think there could be a bit more awareness as far as um you know, the viability of the profession, it can take you anywhere. You can make buckets of money if you stick around. Like, I don't think that's quite being um, 
you know, told to, to younger people. But I think a lot of it starts with, uh, you know, the examples. And this is where, you know, the people that are watching this right now can go into the community and demonstrate what it is to be a CPA, what sort of options you have, just like Joe said. I mean, he, he, he laid it out. He's like, you know, I was told what I could do with this. Um, so that's certainly part of it. I think that the, as far as the CPA exam component, I don't think those people are being fully supported. Um, and I think that's a big reason. And again, back to what Joe said, he is a living example of kind of, you know, somebody who was gently encouraged through the pipeline. He was given time off at his employer to, you know, he could sign off early. Um, so the more that we can do that, the more that we can support people, I think that's certainly going to help. But I think I think there's a lot of factors. You know, that's the whole issue with this pipeline thing. Like Jerry said, you know, you have the, the pending b boomer retirements. It's just a lot of things happening at once. Um, and I don't think if we make a push into more awareness, I don't see any downside to that. So certainly as we're having the discussion about how to address this, awareness definitely needs to be up there as far as like things that, you know, CPAs are going out there and doing. And Jerry, um, you know, we've talked about popular theories about uh, why graduates aren't sitting for the CPA exam, 150 hour requirement, the value of the license versus the effort required to get it. Uh, of course, the basic fear of failure. Um, you've spoken to a lot of professors, you've spoken to a lot of students, you've been in the profession a long time. <clears throat> what do you think um, are some of the reasons that individuals aren't sitting for the exam? Yeah, you know, it's it's really sort of a complex and multi-dimensional issue, Don, as Adrian just alluded to. Um, and, and I just got to say, before I answer this question further, Joe, congrats to you. What a great lesson in persistence, 14 trips to that center. And I love the buzzer beater analogy. Uh, good for you. Congrats. Um, Thanks, Jerry. You know, it's, it's, I think it's always interesting when a profession's been around for over 100 years to consider history, right? The old saying about, you know, if you don't study history, you're doomed to repeat it. So one of the questions I had, and I did a little research in preparation for today, is have there been these types of uh, patterns in the past? And the answer is there have been. So World War II, probably not surprising. I mean, every industry was short people because everybody was off the fight in the war where many people were. So uh, definitely we had a shortage of accountants in the World War II era. Um, but again, much more recently, around the time the 150 hour requirement first came in, that was viewed as a real deterrent, right? An extra year of schooling, um, extra costs. So a lot less people decided to pursue accounting for a period of time. And so um, there are cycles for sure. I can remember when Enron happened and SOX first was enacted, it was a very sort of challenging time for the profession with tons of bad publicity. But ironically, that drove a significant increase in enrollments. And um, the supply sort of rose to meet the new demand that was happening in the profession. So I think one of the nice things about a free market economy is you have these supply demand imbalances that occur periodically and the market tends to react to them. Um, so I'm hopeful that maybe we'll see that longer term here as, as part of the solution. So that's one aspect. On the other hand, I feel like, <clears throat> excuse me, I feel like, you know, since the pandemic hit, there's been sort of a fundamental change that's happening. And, you know, we've all observed the great resignation over the last 18, 24 months. So this is not unique to the accounting profession. I think people are just taking a really fresh look at what is most important in their lives. And when you compare that to some of the demands of the profession, the profession is not grading well, right? So a lot of people are exiting. Um, I feel like the profession has an opportunity to do a better job to react to that. I think we're a profession that, um, you know, to some extent has a mindset, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so for many decades, um, the big accounting firms and others have recruited very successfully from the large state schools, the top accounting programs. They've gotten all the candidates they've needed. So they haven't necessarily had to do something different. But I feel like things have changed fundamentally, and we now do need to start doing something different. Call it a strategic inflection point, if you will. You know, one last comment on 
the profession needs to do a much better job retaining talent. The turnover rates are very high. Demands of the job can be very challenging with busy seasons and audit and in tax and the long hours and the stress and pressure that go along with that. But as someone who you know lived that myself for three and a half decades and worked with our teams, there are things you can do to make that environment not quite as hard or challenging um, as it as it is currently for some people. So think about this. If the profession was able to improve turnover rates uh, or decrease turnover, you know, in the in the 25, 30 percent range, I think the pipeline challenge would be a lot less severe. And one last comment related to that. I mean, we would be remiss if we didn't think about the regulatory environment, particularly for auditors. Uh, you know, it's become a very challenging regulatory environment in the last 15, 20 years with the advent of the PCOB. And I'm the first one to say audit quality is important. We have an important responsibility in serving the capital markets. We need to get that right. But candidly, the regulatory environment is a factor in driving people out of the profession, in my opinion. Right. right. No, agreed. Um, <clears throat> something you said actually led, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> leads me to a question that we've gotten. And by the way, if you, if you, um, I see that there are a number of questions being submitted. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the, uh, the Q and A. Uh, but someone submitted a question, Jerry, I'll throw this to you first. It says not all firms, especially smaller firms want to support the CPA exam. If there's a chance that the candidate may leave for a bigger firm, why should they make the investment for possible little return? So it's that idea of, well, I'm going to put all of this effort and support into somebody and then they might leave. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I understand the concern and, and the uh, small firms are maybe operating on a little bit tighter budget. Every investment's important. Certainly you want to get a return on every investment. But, you know, my view is that's a little bit short-sighted. Um, you have to be willing to invest in your people. I don't care if it's a big four firm or a sole practitioner with only a handful of employees. The people side of things is so important, and in my experience, the people that the firms that invest in their people are going to win in the long term. You know, you you may not keep everybody, but if you help five young folks get their CPA certificate by having that culture and that environment that encourages them, supports them, along the lines Joe was describing. Um, and two of them wind up leaving and three of them wind up staying, staying your firm's going to be better off in the long run, you know, in my opinion. So I think it's an investment you have to make. People have to be at the top of the list. Right. And I think there's a, a rule of thumb when it comes to training, you know, thought processes. Well, why should I provide all of this training for somebody if they might leave? And the counter argument is, well, what if you don't provide that training and they stay? So I think you, you, you <laughs> have to look at it from a perspective of, well, think you know try and give them reasons to stay give them reasons to stay and then and then train them yeah there's always that possibility that, that they could leave but if you don't train them and they stay then you know you're, you're probably worse off all right <clears throat> excuse me um adrian uh jerry was talking about kind of the ebbs and flows within um the cpa profession uh when i started with the cpa society 17 years ago they were just coming out of uh, WorldCom, Enron, um, SOX had just been passed, the, the Accountant Full Employment Act, as, as I was told, uh, 17 years ago. Um, in the late 90s, there were a lot of concerns about accounting enrollments uh, because we had the, uh, the tech boom. Folks were, were not going into accounting because they were going to technology firms, they were going to Wall Street. Then Enron WorldCom happened, and it, there was like a flight to safety. The flight to safety is always uh, accounting and CPA licenses. So there's kind of these ebbs and flows. We also see shortages in other professions. We've heard about shortages for of nurses, engineers, teachers, and so forth. So how much of this, how much of the CPA shortage do you think is cyclical versus an indication of a more fundamental recruitment challenge? I mean, I look at what we've been writing on Going Concern. We've been around since 2009, and I started in CPA Review in 2007. So I've been, you know, circling the profession like a vulture for 15 years. And, you know, we saw in 2007 at CPA Review, we saw, of course, just as you just described, the kind of, you know, flood of candidates because accounting was hiring great. Everything's wonderful. Um, but 
I would say the pipeline problem has been brewing certainly before the pandemic. The pandemic is what's driving this great resignation, all that stuff, these shortages. Um, we've been writing about ongoing concern. We used to call it the talent shortage, but I would say about 10 years. And it's about 2016 is about when we started kind of sounding the alarm and saying, um, you know, this is more than just firms not being able to hold on to people. There's something brewing here. Um, so certainly there are cycles. Um, without a doubt, but I, I feel like there's something. And what I always say is that if it were only one thing, it wouldn't be that big of a deal, right? If we didn't have all these boomers retiring, if we didn't have, uh, you know, you've got the accounting professor shortage too. Let's not forget about, you know, the shortage of PhDs. Right. There's a lot of stuff happening right now. We've got, as Jerry described, you know, the regulatory environment, we've got um, just all this stuff kind of piled up. If it were just the kind of cycle, I don't think it would be that big of a deal. Um, we're possibly heading into a recession. The pipeline could be solved tomorrow when people start piling in. But I think fundamentally, there's still something there that needs to be addressed. Um, and I think it's been brewing for some time based on what we've written over the years, for sure. Okay. Uh, and Joe, this, this next question is for you. Um, I think it was about 10 years ago, we held a, a retreat up at Crystal Springs for, for managing partners. And we had a, a nationally known speaker who was talking about uh, the, the next generation, um, the millennials. He wasn't, um, uh, Gen X, my generation, we're, you know, we're half the size of, of the baby boomers. So we're certainly not gonna replace all those retiring boomers. So it was really looking to the millennials to say, you know, how, are the, how is that generation gonna replace the boomers? And the, the speaker was talking to these managing partners and describing what it was that millennials wanted from their career, from their profession. And it was very, very different than what baby boomers probably wanted from their careers when they were in their 20s and 30s. And it just, it struck me at the time that the, the managing partners were just flabbergasted that younger people didn't want the same things that they wanted when they were the, the same age. And a lot of it was, you know, a partnership track, money, um, you know, and maybe some of the superficial things like the country club membership and, and things like that. So I mean, is Joe, is one of the, the challenges about attracting today's accounting leaders, um, what, the issues that, that what attracted leaders 20, 30 years ago is not going to attract young professionals now. So it could be money, it could be prestige, but uh, how much of that factors into this the decline in, in CPA licenses? The profession's just not doing the things it needs to to attract the younger generation. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. And I think it, it actually speaks to the fundamental um, that Adrian was kind of referring to. I think Sobel and Company lets me do both of those things. So all those things that you were speaking about with 20, 30 years ago, here's the here's where your partnership track is. Here's where, you know, here's where you can make a difference. Here's where you can grow. Here's the new opportunities, you know, that you can have there. There's just everything at your fingertips. So I think all that stuff is still there and maybe fundamentally we need to do a better job communicating that. But I, I also agree that, you know, everybody graduating from college and, you know, this is exactly how I felt four years ago when I, when I graduated, finished my master's degree and started was I wanted to, you know, have a why I, I wanted to, you know, the, the work that I was doing, I wanted there to be some purpose there. And it was actually how I got through the CPA exam. I was struggling. Um, you know, I probably, probably failed far a, a couple times and I was just, you know, what am I going to be doing? And I, during that summer, I, I read start with why by Simon Sinek and we've read it as part of our, our NGCPA book club. And I think people really are looking for that now. And, you know, I think what people are doing is they are seeing, you know, they're, they're in school and they say, well, I want to be the leader of an organization that's going to do something with him that, that has some impact. And maybe they're looking towards the management degree and they're just saying, OK, well, I'm going to take, you know, maybe or the finance track. I'm going to be a finance person to get my MBA and then I'm going to try to get in a management position at a company that's doing things that mean something to me. And where I think we need to, to show people early on in their their accounting journey is, you know, if you want to be a, if you want to be a part of an organization that's doing that doing that is doing something very meaningful, you can do that. There are accounting positions at the Make a Wish Foundation, one of my favorites. There's accounting positions um, at several nonprofits and, and and even just and even for profit organizations that are doing things that you care about. So that's something I think we really need to, you know, share with um, people early on. I think one of the things that might you know kind of making this a bringing a full circle is one of the things, the, the exam is definitely scary, but
But if we show people earlier on, you know, here's what you can do, maybe freshman, sophomore year of high school rather than senior year, um, you know, that, hey, here's some of the different opportunities and here's the ways you can make an impact in the world. That is, you know, I, I think one of the keys. I, and I think that's a, a great point, Joe. And it's just to put my, my marketing hat out for a little bit. I think one of the, the areas where the profession could do a better job and individual CPAs could do a better job is, is talking about purpose and connecting the license with purpose. Because all the research indicates that, that individuals want to work for or belong to companies and organizations that believe the same things that they do. And they want, as you were just saying, they want their work to have meaning. And I think where we all fall down sometimes is connecting the license to that purpose, um, that the the license is not an end in itself, but it's a means to an end, and that end is 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 purposeful work. So I, I think that's a great point, and I would say, you know, if, for the folks watching and listening, you know, if you're looking for takeaways from a presentation like this, I think what Joe just said is a, is a big one. Um, make sure that people, the people who are working for you, the people you know, understand that you know, giving having a CPA license will give them the opportunity to do meaningful work and and, and do great things, and that's something that we've been encouraging our members to do more of is tell your stories. There, there are great CPA stories out there, and a lot of times you kind of get bogged down in process as opposed to trying to talk about the, the, uh, the stories and the end result. Um, and I, I think that's a great point uh, by you, Joe. I, I just want to follow up on, on, uh, on something. I'm wondering now, because I was reading actually earlier today that um, there is a big problem with, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier, a big problem with, because it's so easy to find a job now, and um, there's really, there doesn't seem to be much of a stigma around being somewhere for six months and leaving, is an opportunity for the profession to focus on career as opposed to job. Because now it seems like a lot of younger people are focused on, on job and going so from job to job because maybe it's a better opportunity. But does the CPA license give us an opportunity to talk about, well, you don't wanna just have a series of jobs, you wanna have a career. And with a license, you can actually have a, a, a several different types of careers. So what do you think about that, Joe? Is, is there too much emphasis now on job as opposed to, to career amongst this next generation of professionals? Yeah, I think it's um, the people that are feeling that way are, are very short-sighted. And that's not, to, that's not to say how they're feeling is, is wrong or anything like that. I just think the, you know, you can, you can get a reputation for, you know, if you're somewhere for six months and you, you head somewhere else for that, you know, another year, and then you head somewhere else for another year. And I, I do think the CPA license allows you to, to really build something and, and build a career and become somebody that is trusted in the, in the community and trusted with the people that you're working with. So the, the license really, really opens up all those doors for you. And I would encourage anybody that's you know, kind of on the fence to, to really, or, or on the fence with the, you know, going from one opportunity to another, simply, you know, for, for thing, you know, for whatever reason it is, just ask yourself, you know, where is this fitting into what I want to do? I was having a conversation with somebody lately that was um, kind of sharing, we were talking about some goals and stuff like that and really like map out what you want to be and then figure out how you're going to get there. And if you just kind of focus on the next step each time, you're, you might find yourself getting off track. So, so diving into what you want that, that career to be, you know, is, is super important. Um, so let's turn to, we got about 20 minutes left. Let's, let's turn to what the, the profession uh, can do to address the issue and not necessarily fix it, but maybe address it. And that, that includes the profession, includes CPAs, firms, companies, uh, CPA society, state boards of accountancy, you, you name it. Um, Jerry, I know you've been a big advocate for the profession doing a better job of recruiting at the community college level. Um, why do you believe this is a, a viable strategy to address the pipeline challenge? Yeah, Don, so you mentioned in the introductions that I've been spending some time since retiring from KPMG at Rowan University here in South Jersey uh, in a role they call executive in residence. Um, so, you know, that, that gives me an opportunity to have a lot of contact with the students. I give some guest lectures. Um, I've been working with their accounting advisory board, and I meet with a lot of students one-on-one -on -one and just trying to address the questions and concerns that are on their mind as they think about their futures. And Rowan is a very uh, diverse student population. It's a public university. I would say the vast majority of the students that attend are first time, first generation college. Um, 
And many of them also will transfer to Rowan after spending a couple years at a local community college. And I will tell you, I have been very impressed with some of the young men and women that I've met and spoken with and tried to help in that regard. Um, the reason they're coming through the community college system is the cost of higher education continues to increase at a significant level. And uh, many of these kids and families have student loans. It's, it's a really significant cost to get their college education. And I think they're doing it in a very smart way. I mean, Rowan's a good school. They have a great accounting program. But the cost of two years at community college is a fraction. And then if you, if you balance that with two years at a public university where the tuition tends to be a lot lower than a lot of private universities, you can still get a high quality education at a reasonable cost. In addition, many of these students coming through the community college systems are diverse. And we touched on this earlier in the program today that the profession needs to do a better job of raising awareness and accessing the full talent pool and recruiting some of those underrepresented populations that haven't traditionally been a big part of the employment pool at public accounting firms and really more broadly in industry. So I think getting out to meet these students at the community college level is a chance to educate them, make them aware about careers in accounting, make them aware of what a great profession and career path this can be, and, and actually steer them towards accounting. You know, a lot of kids at that level don't really know what they want to do. They're taking a lot of general courses. So for firms of all sizes to have a presence there, educate them about the profession, I think it could really make a difference in expanding that pipeline. And listen, the war for talent is raging at all levels, right? I see how the big four compete intensely for the top students. Why not get to know them a couple years early when they're at that community college level? Um, you know, historically, the big national firms, and I think most firms of all sizes, haven't been willing to invest at that level. Maybe there's an apprehension that these kids are too early. We don't even know if they're going to be accounting majors yet. But as I said earlier, you know, I think it's time to change. You know, what's been working for the last four or five decades maybe needs an overhaul in this brave new world where the challenges are going to get to be larger as that pool of candidates declines because of birth rates and all the reasons you hit on in your introductions. But I do think there's a strong tie in here to the diversity issue. The profession is not where it should be with respect to diversity. And to change that, we need to do something different. And I think community colleges would be a great place to do it. Okay. And I definitely want to jump into the diversity issue with Adrian because I know she's written about it. But we do have a question from the audience I wanted to, to get to, and this is uh, an important issue as well. We tend, when we talk about the pipeline issue, I, I think just sort of the knee-jerk reaction is to talk about public accounting, but um, certainly private role in addressing this challenge. So here's the question. Uh, how do we get corporate America to put a value on the license? Unless in the corporate accounting team, it is not mandatory to have a CPA when these roles are posted. So, uh, Jerry, I'll ask you, um, you know, what can state CPA societies do, professors or even just CPAs, what can we do, do you think, to kind of uh, instill in corporate America that the CPA license uh, does matter and, and can play a big difference? Yeah, so I don't know if I'm a, a bit of an outlier here, Don, but as someone who over the decades literally lost hundreds of really talented young professionals who would join my firm, you know, be there two, three, four, five years, get their CPA, get the experience we offered, and then move into corporate America, typically for a very significant increase in compensation, typically for a pretty nice, you know, role or position. My view is that corporate America very much understands and appreciates the value of the CPA certificate and kind of the training and experience that public accounting provides. And I feel like we've sort of been grooming their future employees for decades. Um, so, you know, they may not talk about it that much, but trust me, they know because uh, uh, they've been recruiting people out of public accounting for a long time. I don't know if that's responsive to your question, but that's that's sort of my view. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think it suggests that maybe it's still at the individual level, that if there are more graduates going directly into industry, that, that 
getting them before they get into industry, you know, uh, is probably still critical to do because um, that I think there's more opportunities to talk to them whether they're in college and maybe when they just get out about taking the CPA exam than once they get in. Because once they get in, they I think they start to more closely identify with the industry that they work in, whether it's, you know, pharmaceuticals or finance or something. So um, yeah, it may not I be may so much. Misunderstood, a... I may have misunderstood your question, Don. I was talking about it more people leaving the professional industry. And I guess your question dealt more with people when they graduate from college who go into industry, do they think getting the CPA is a good idea? And I, I think it kind of goes back to your earlier point about if their employer doesn't require it, which many corporations in industry would not, that can be a, a reason to say, well, why do I really want to do that? It's a hard exam. It costs money. It costs a lot of time and effort to study for. And if I'm going to get the same raise and promotion without it. So I don't, I don't know that I have a great answer for that. I would like to think CFOs, controllers, accounting managers would appreciate the value of the CPA certificate and all that it entails and be willing to help finance that and encourage their people to get it. I'm sure some do, but I also suspect many don't. Right. And I think it's important for the, the CPAs who are employed at, at large corporations to um, to promote the fact that they're a CPA. I see a lot of CPAs who work in industry. I'll, I'll look them up on LinkedIn and they don't even put CPA after their name. So I, I think it's it's really uh, to some extent on CPAs or an in industry to make sure that their their bosses or, or their colleagues and peers understand, you know, that the license is important to them and it should be important to um, to the company as well. Um, we're, we're getting short on time, so I did want to dump, uh, j jump into the, the diversity issue. Um, Adrian, I know you've written and Going Concern has written a lot about the diversity issue or the lack of diversity in the in the profession. Um, what do you think that the profession can do to, to make itself more inclusive? I think that I know that state societies especially are doing a lot kind of on this issue and I think everything we're talking about today like just now talking about you're talking about you know CFOs evangelizing the the CPA I think diversity is solved the same way it's by people who have followed that path going out and demonstrating to others you know but especially with diversity we you know I think Jerry touched on it early on um, people want to see people who look like themselves when they come in the office, they want to, you know, they want to see somebody that they can relate to. And it doesn't have to be like direct, but, you know, they need to, especially at upper levels, right, in leadership. And I think we've made some progress, but there's a long way to go um, as far as that goes. So I think it's going to be slow. I mean, it was estimated what 1% of CPAs in the United States are black and that number hasn't changed in 40 years. That's a pretty significant um, hurdle that needs to be uh, jumped over. But I think the best way that that can be accomplished is by setting an example and by, um, you know, the diverse, it, it's asking a lot of people to go out in their community, you know, they're working and they've got their lives and also to have them kind of go out and mentor on top of it. But I think that's kind of going to be the best way. And as Jerry said, you know, uh, reaching out to other schools, looking at different pools. I think accounting is great. You know, um, for someone from a disadvantaged background, you don't have to go to a top school to have a great career. Just, you know, in law, you've got to go to the school that gets recruited in accounting. You don't have to do that. Um, so I think we need to make sure we're going to those schools that we're accessing those students and also that um, scholarships, you know, that we need to remove all the barriers that we can to, to the extent we can, right? We can't just eat the 150 hour rule or whatever but you right. know there's certain barriers that we can lighten or soften or remove and i think we need to be doing that yeah no i think that's a great point and, and just i'll do a shameless plug for the society we set up um with with help from uh, deloitte um minority scholarship program last year uh, the challenging thing and this i think goes to the awareness issue the challenging thing is actually getting into the schools to talk about these things because schools are so overwhelmed by uh organizations and rules and regulations that just getting into uh, an inner city school is so incredibly challenging for an organization like ours but that's where we kind of go back to the um the, the cpas themselves they may have better connections at these schools than we do either because it's, they could be they could have gone there they could have kids there they could have some political connection there um so that's why we, you know we always encourage our members like listen we may not be able to get a, into a school you know in new jersey say in newark or camden or um some other places but you might be able to as an individual because they may be more responsive to an individual as opposed to an organization that you know a lot of people are going to think has a has an agenda um 
So I think, you know, it's interesting with the diversity issue, I think all of the issues that we've talked about, um, awareness, time, money, um, all of these things play a factor in trying to make the, the, the profession more diverse and, and could lead hopefully to some positive results. Um, so Joe, I, I know that you, I hope I got this correct, you actually are mentoring a uh, high school student, is that correct? C correct, That's, yep. Okay, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the opportunity presented itself through the State Society's High School Internship Program, and really what, what, what came from that was um, a really great relationship with the accounting teacher at my high school, Parsimony Hills, who was not my teacher, but we, we've formed a really good relationship over the four years that I've gone there um, during the fall time and, and spoken to her classes. She has two. And what, what happened there was she reached out to me probably during busy season about February and said, you know, I have a really great student who would be, you know, we're starting a professional co-op program. You know, everybody's pretty familiar with the co-op programs for different types of, um, uh, for different industries. And she said they were starting this program, which so we'll go be interested in, you know, hosting a high school student for a month. And we got our heads together we, you know, in a room and we talked about it. So this would be an awesome opportunity. So the student was with us for a month, uh, 20 hours a week, and it was a great opportunity. And, and just the excitement, you know, at that level, you know, he's 18 going, um, going away to college in a few weeks. And the excitement about what he was doing was just through the roof. And really where I think, you know, we can grasp that is, is really, you know, hone in on that and, and take that forward. Like, don't let that fire even, even go out a little bit, you know, keep that fire raging. And I think we're, where we can make a difference and fundamentally the changes we can make is it really all comes down to relationships and, and maintaining that relationship throughout, you know, the time bef before they come in and work wherever you're working. So some of the things we're doing at Soulbuild Company is we're, we're, we're trying to offer this high school internship program going forward during the summers. High school get to know us program is I think what we're going to try to call it. And really that's just an opportunity, you know, whatever stage in high school they are is, let's let's get the communication started and let's um, start the conversation but then also maintaining that conversation so not just you know now they're a senior or maybe we maybe we met them when they're a sophomore but then not talking into not talking to them again until you're senior they're seniors that's that's fundamentally where i think we can make a change and maintaining that relationship um, investing earlier on is is definitely i think the key but you know, I don't, a lot of people have spoken about middle school. I'm not sure if middle school, if the message will get diluted based on, you know, just that, whether it's just a typical career discussion about here's some careers that you can think of. I think high school and, and starting that conversation freshman year and continuing it sophomore, junior year um, really can get people prepared to put together a thoughtful uh, application for one of the NJCPA high school you know, scholarships. I think that's where you know, they can get a lot of excitement going and, um, and take it forward. Right. Well, I think you illustrate a great point. You know, here at the, at the State Society and the AICPA, we, you know, we deal in, in bigger numbers. We're dealing in hundreds or, or thousands. So we're, you know, we're mass communication. But I think how this problem gets solved is going to be exactly what you're doing. It's going to be on an individual level. It's mm -hmm. going to be one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, and you know, it, it, it would be nice if we could bring in, you know, thousands of new recruits through an email marketing campaign or social media and so forth. But I think it's it's really going to happen um, on an individual, one-on-one -on -one basis, similar to to what you're doing. Yeah, it's it's boots on the ground, and I even met somebody on the golf course the other day who's uh, home for a few more weeks before he goes back to college, and I said, hey, here's my card. You know, just shoot me a text. If you ever want to get together? Let's just talk about what you're going through. He's a sophomore in college right now, and it's really, it's really us just being there and offering that hand. And, and you know, people are going to want, want to work with somebody that they trust. And that first decision, you know, wherever you're going to go right out of school, um, or if you're making a career switch, whether you, the fact that you trust somebody where you're going to go, where you're hoping to go work, a potential employer is going to make a world of difference. And I think that's what will initially attract people. That CPA pipeline can continue, you know, we can, we can restock it. Um, we can kind of restock the farm system um, as the Yankees have done these last couple of years and they're not bringing anybody up, but we can restock the farm system and really get those people onto our teams um, quicker. And maybe we can, we can actually, um, ho hopefully their careers will grow with us. 
All right, great. Well, uh, we only have a few minutes left, and I do apologize for, I know there were a lot of questions that came in, and I apologize for not being able to get to, to a lot of them. So, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll try and address them um, either during the replay or, or in some other, uh, some other way. Um, so since we're running up against time, I, I did want to give all of our panelists an opportunity to share any, any concluding remarks. Jerry, since we started with you, um, we'll, we'll start the beginning of our ending with you, if that makes sense. Uh, do you think, you, I mentioned you'd written a book. Do you think your book can be a, a potential resource to help with the pipeline challenge? Yeah, well, you know, Don, it's, it's certainly not gonna be a silver bullet that's gonna solve the problem, but I do like to think it's a tool, it's a resource to maybe raise awareness with some of the constituencies we've been talking about today, high school students, community college students, perhaps undeclared business majors. You know, chapter one of my book is entitled Why Accounting is a Terrific Profession. And it certainly covers financial rewards, but it talks about all the other aspects of, you know, it's interesting, it's lifelong learning, it's a seat at the table. And I do talk about purpose extensively in there as well. Chapter two of the book is focused on becoming a CPA. So it sort of ties right into this conversation and one of my personal goals is to try and get the book out into inner city high schools, um, public libraries, community colleges, just to kind of raise awareness, again, particularly with underrepresented populations. All right, great, thank you. Uh, Adrian, how about you? Any, any uh, last second thoughts? So I think, um... <clears throat> You know, I have the, there's this kid that I play Overwatch with, literally a kid, he's like 18 years old, and he's trying to decide what he wants to be when he grows up, you know, it, as we're playing Overwatch, shooting people, you know, we have these deep discussions about what do I want to be when I grow up, and one of the things I told him was, think about accounting. You know, and I told him all the pluses and, you know, the benefits. And, you know, we talked about how much his education might cost and he's considering it. So what I would say to the membership, everyone watching this is, you know, look around your own community. And as you said, Don, you, it doesn't have to be some huge effort to, you know, reach an entire high school. Just go out there and be an example and, you know, look around your own neighborhood, look around your family, look around the kids you play Overwatch with. If you do play with anybody and, you know, just talk it up and share your story. And, you know, you never know, you might, I mean, it's not gonna solve the problem, but you know, an extra person or two is certainly gonna help and it adds up. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, Joe, how about you? Any last minute thoughts? Yeah, I, I would say just share those those success stories and those the, the stories of the people that you've worked with and how you've contributed to their success and, you know, invest in the relationships with the people that are, that are really coming into our profession. It'll yield great results if you can build that trust and, you know, be that person um, for that, you know, new CPA. All right, great. Well, uh, Joe, Jerry, Adrian, thank you so much. I thought this was a, a very enlightening session. I thought, you know, great feedback, great advice. And uh, for everyone else out there, uh, thank you all for attending. Be sure to visit our CPA Pipeline Knowledge Hub at njcpa.org slash pipeline. In particular, check out our recent Issues Watch podcast episode with two NJCPA members who recently received the Elijah Watt Sells Award for Outstanding CPA Performance. They talk about their approach to the exam and what they think can be done to address the CPA pipeline problem. And in our next episode, available soon, three college accounting educators weigh in on the CPA pipeline problem from their perspective and what they're hearing from students. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>